everyone, and welcome to Look Down There, the show where we talk about all the things we don't talk about. I'm your host, Michelle Amore. Today, my guest is a performance artist, burlesque dancer, and choreographer. She holds an MFA in media, interactive media and performance, and she has traveled over the world, seducing the world one stage at a time. She currently holds residencies at Dwayne Park and Slipper Room in NYC, classic venues if you haven't checked them out. And she's here with me today to discuss her new work in pleasure. Here she is, Peekaboo Point. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So happy to see you happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. You have that smile that just, you know, makes everybody happy. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Great. Well, okay. So let's get started. Um, Burlesque versus performance art. I think that burlesque can be performance art, but performance art is not always burlesque. So how do you define each of those, each of those art forms? And what is performance art anyway? Oh, I mean that we could have an entire afternoon talking about what performance art is. Um, I feel, I feel like burlesque, just like you said, can be performance art. It's not necessarily always, um, but I feel, I feel like, oh God, how do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Performance art makes you think about things in a different way, maybe stirs up an emotion that maybe you didn't expect or inspires you to have a conversation about something that might surprise you. Um, It layers together concepts and theories in a way that makes you question your world. Yeah. So real easy to define. Um, <laughs> like very direct. <laughs> yes. Um, so give me an example of a piece of performance art that you have done in your career. Um, so I have one that's actually means the world to me. Um, and it just came back last week. I got to do it for the first time after all the pandemic. So it felt really nice um, to like get it back on stage. Um, so it's a piece I call Superman and it come, I start out as a classic burlesque dance, um, classic strip tease. Um, and then about a quarter of the way into it, I take off my dress. I do some like silk, um, scarf work. And then, um, I reach my hand into the audience and go into the audience and find one man. Um, always a man um, that's like part of the piece. And I bring him on stage with me and we have a duet. And the duet lasts about five minutes. So it's a pretty significant time to be on stage. Um, in that duet, we breathe together, we make eye contact, we dance, um, we share balance, we share weight which is really uh, not an easy thing to do with a stranger that you just pulled out of the audience at midnight at the slipper room. (laughs) Um, And then basically it starts out fun and then it slowly gets taken all the, um, it gets stripped down to he's sitting in the, in a chair and he's holding me at the end. And I'm just, my arms are wrapped around him. And all you can see is his face from the audience perspective. So you're watching him soften through the whole five minutes. And you're seeing his reactions to me being around him. And then at the end, it's, my goal was to show a vulnerable, a vulnerability between two people and to kind of expose a softer side of masculinity at the same time. Um, And it turns out really beautifully at the end. And now with after COVID, it just puts another whole level on it as like closeness and intimacy and, 
yeah, it's a little heavier now. I think it was heavy before, but it's, it gets, it's a little, it's, it has changed for sure. Wow. That sounds incredible. Like I feel teary just listening to it. I can't imagine what it would be like to see that. Are you, are you fully naked at this point or what are you wearing? I'm in a pasties and G string by the end of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what is the response? Like, I can imagine it's like really timid and kind of like laughing cause it's uncomfortable and then just kind of giving into this moment. Yeah, it does. It, it does like the length of time that we're together. There is, there is, it's to always starts out. We're laughing together. We're smiling. The audience is laughing with us. Their friends or whoever he came with is like, yeah, you know, and then within that time, it, it generally comes to silence, like about a little right before I sit on his lap. It's like, wait, what's happening? And it's, and it becomes something else. Um, it kind of like, it's almost like every man I've done it with becomes safe in that moment. And it's not, it's no longer like this silly fun time. <laughs> How do you go about choosing your, your audience member, especially um, now? I, I'm very, it's, it's a lot of consent. So I, I'm very particular, especially about this one, about verbally saying, will you please join me on stage? And I've had many people be like, I really don't want to. And then I'm like, okay. And it's not like the normal, like audience participation where you're like, come on, do it anyway. It's like, nope, that's fine. And I'll move on. Um, I mean, there's been a couple of nights where I've had to move on several times. And if someone's willing to say, okay, usually they're going to have the right energy, but if there's like a resistance, it's, there's a resistance for a reason. And I have to like, be okay with that. Yeah. That's all. That's always one of the things that's bothered me about audience participation is that consent piece where they're just like dragged up and they really don't want to go. And yeah, I, I appreciate that you, that you do that and you listen, but you also like sit in the know and and I think that's really important to witness as well as an audience member is to watch someone receiving a no and that it, you know, you don't have to take it personally or you can just move on to the next thing and respect that person's place, like where they are in their life right now at that moment. And that it has nothing to do with you. Yeah, exactly. And it, there is a moment, the first time it happened, I was like, Oh, <laughs> like, well, it always like stings a little bit, but it's like, no, it's, I don't, I don't want to force anyone to do anything. And I personally hate being on the pulled up as an audience member. So I get it. <laughs> oh, same. I absolutely hate it. And I, cause I'm also just like, I'm not at work. Like, just leave me alone. <laughs> like I just am here to see a show and that's it. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, but when people are, no, oh, I just don't want to. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've been studying a lot with, with consent and doing a lot of work with that, but um, no really truly is a gift because if someone gives you a no, then you know what their limitations are and you know how to better interact with them, you know, and I know this is an audience member and you wouldn't necessarily see them again, but just in general, like in your life, is it, do you experience discomfort when you hear no from maybe loved ones or people, you know, better than you might know an audience member? I mean, yeah, <laughs> I think receiving a no is always like, <sighs> but I also, I'm grateful every time someone says no to me, cause I'm like, Oh, great. Then I know exactly where you stand. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's a good thing. And it's been something that I've been trying to put more into practice in my own life too, is learning how to say no and not feel guilty and not, it has so much, so much around it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you mentioned, you know, this time in the pandemic, and I know that we had our own personal discussion about this, but how has your relationship changed with art, with burlesque, with performance art um, in the pandemic and coming out of it? It was a real struggle for me. Um, The pandemic really, like, I just, it, I collapsed under the sudden, like the abrupt, no performance as this is coming out so weird, (laughs) but, um, yeah, I just, it was devastating. It was devastating as a person who had been performing five nights a week for the last 15 years to not have that outlet on stage was more destabilizing than anything I'd ever experienced. Um, I didn't realize how much I relied on it and how my own sense of self and (laughs) artistic everything, my like social life, my self-worth, everything was wrapped up in stage. And so when it disappeared, I really had to reevaluate what was important to me and what was it that I needed, wanted to say, what what do I need from art? What do I need from my work? Um, And tried to put into practice a more sustainable life for myself as an artist. Um, And also with all of that came this huge artistic block Mm. um, that I, I feel like I'm starting to come out of and getting inspired by some of the books that I've read and some of the feelings that I've had during the pandemic. And um, I'm coming to the other side, feeling stronger and more empowered as a woman and also an artist. So. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of tough when your whole life is, or most of your life has this, huge piece of external validation. Like most people don't have that, you know, but as performers, it's, it's applause, it's constant applause, which is like, oh, boohoo. So sorry for us. But like, (laughs) it's like, you know, I think we should all wake up to applause every morning. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Were, Were you able to find any, kind of satisfaction in the, in the video work that you were doing? Cause you were doing really cool, um, like stop motion performance art, um, strip teases, like erotic pieces that I thought were really great. Would, did that help fill something for you? Absolutely. It really did. Um, and it was, it's funny. Cause as soon as, I mean, I guess it's not funny, but I was working on that in grad school in my MFA program. I had learned stop motion and gotten really into it and never had time to actually do it because it's insanely time consuming. (laughs) Um, And then suddenly I was given this like all the time in the world and an empty studio space in Bushwick. And so I just kind of dove right in. Um, I found it really difficult at, first because there was no applause. There's no, like I'd spend 12 hours in the studio making 30 seconds of video work, which I would be so excited about. But at the end of it, it was like, but why isn't anybody telling me I'm amazing? (laughs) So it's such a bizarre Mm -hmm. experience. And it, it, I had to really, it forced me so far inside to, to be okay with not having the applause was really, it's, it's a, it's, it was like a learned response, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I got the response when I posted it on Instagram or wherever. I'm like, Oh, there's there. I get my likes. And it started like, Oh, I got likes thousand people watched it. Yes. (laughs) So, um, but it, it did turn me more to have to work independently was like a totally different experience. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And being comfortable without that applause. I mean, just like you were talking about with your performance art, like usually in burlesque, it's like, well, ah, hoot and holler and everybody's crazy. And I notice performers get very uncomfortable if people aren't screaming the entire time and losing their minds. So they, they pander and they just like throw stuff at the audience to try to get a reaction, mm -hmm. but like being comfortable with that stillness and that silence, I think is the most powerful thing you could do on stage. I agree. It's kind of my, that's kind of my jam. Oh <laughs> I, yeah. We share well, that. <laughs> we share that. We audience to silence is actually like my goal. <laughs> yeah. It's like, sometimes I get, uh, annoyed if people, uh, like hoot and holler or clap. I'm like, are you even watching? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm still make eye contact with me. Be yeah. present with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, am I not doing my job here? <laughs> Cause you should all be stunned to silence. That's how I feel. <laughs> I'm with you a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so where, where are you finding your interests moving towards now? Um, so now I'm, I'm thinking big picture. I kind of sat down and thought if I could only do one thing, what would I want to do right now? And I started dreaming up this, um, bigger performance project, um, thinking in like an evening length work that probably is going to take me a year, like maybe over a year to create, I th think when it comes down to it, um, so about pleasure and politics and the power of finding our own pleasure and how we use that as a political force. Mm -hmm. for yeah. So you were talking about pleasure mapping. So mm -hmm. can you tell me more about what that is and how to do that? Yeah. So this whole piece is going to be centered around, um, pleasure mapping, which I've found, I started doing for myself as kind of tracking my, um, my lineage of how I learned to receive pleasure, experience pleasure and where even just not just sexual pleasure, but just any, you know, pleasure as a, like a bigger topic, um, throughout my life and then tracking how my mom taught me and then how my grandmother influenced me and all the way back as far as I can find in my family, like where those, where it was taught to me and how I reacted as a result of those passed down learned experiences, which also, you know, gets really deep into like tracking my family's baggage and trauma and all of that stuff comes together and finding my own way through that. So pleasure mapping is that like tracking that lineage of pleasure and then seeing how we can use that to better the world and to spread, you know, maybe what my mom learned and taught me was a reason, a part of a, you know, patriarchal value that was put on to her and how can we like release that and change it and change our world into a better place as a result. So how would you say that pleasure is a political act? Like the act of feeling good is a political act. Well, especially as women, we've been told that we don't even have pleasure <laughs> that we're not allowed to sit in our pleasure. I mean, even, you know, a lot of not so recently we weren't even, it was a mystery that women even had orgasms. You know, it's just like the fact that like our pleasure is so controlled and how we are taught to shame ourselves when we feel pleasure, all this like learned experiences that are coming in to affect the way that we act in society. Um, 
and finding, you know, as Audre Lord says, finding that yes in everything can propel us into being stronger, more open forces of good to speak up for what we need to say what we want in life and to like help us walk through in a more powerful way. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Audre Lorde, but you know, she says that we've been taught to, to fear the erotic taught to fear the yes. And that the erotic has been relegated to the bedroom and even there in the bedroom, it's still not about you, (laughs) right? Like you have to be really intentional to experience that pleasure because I think what we're conditioned to do is just give and give and give, but we're not conditioned to experience. And something that I really like to think about is that um, I'm taking this class right now and they say that um, pleasure is not about giving and receiving. It's about experiencing. And I really love that because it takes a lot of the pressure off. I feel like it's just like, "Mm," like, let's just sit in this experience together. Like whether you're with someone or not, it's, it's the experience of it. Yeah. It's being present, Mm -hmm. being present in all the feelings that are coming around you. And so how, how has doing this work affected your life on and off stage? Um, at the moment, it's making me really uh, kind of introspective at present. Um, I think once I get into the studio with other people and start doing it as a group, I think it's going to really change. Um, but it's making me look at kind of every decision that I ever made with a, a, through a totally different lens. It's like, I look at, you know, what I did when I was 30 and think, Oh, was that because I was trying to find that thing that I found ended up finding and how did I get there? Um, I know that's super vague, but, um, but it really has kind of made me, it's revealing a lot about where I've been and what I've done in my life. Yeah. And how have you like it it, sometimes like when we get to this point of enlightenment and we've like, we've found the thing that we were looking for. And we look back when we were like looking for the thing, um, it can kind of be hard to look back at our old selves and like see the struggle and see the mistakes and maybe see some of the hurt that we um, did to others or did to ourselves. Um, have you found some forgiveness or compassion or grace for yourself in, in that process? Yeah, I have. And there, there has been like a grieving period in a way too. the grieving of the time and grieving of the struggle. And, you know, you always want to say like, I wish I could have gotten here sooner, <laughs> But, but that's not part of the path and, and the acceptance of being present with where you are is, has been, I think there's, yeah, for me that I think there's a lot of grief, but there's a lot of, um, yeah, forgiveness as well. Mm-hmm. And, there- and also like forgiveness of, you know, my, like my mom and my grandma and like all is like, I forgive you for teaching me these things or showing me that this is the way and it wasn't the way. (laughs) So, and there's, there's a lot of like letting go of that. Yeah. Very important um, and difficult work to heal that mother daughter relationship. And mm -hmm. is there anything that has surprised you about this process and how you experience pleasure? Hmm. I mean, it has surprised me that to go back to all the places that I 
I knew that I was looking for it and didn't know what I was like. It just surprises me when I was on this. I've always been obsessed with all things like stripper and sex, like since the beginning of, I can remember. And so when I think about like my first job in college was at this sex shop and I'm selling like dildos and vibrators and I'm talking about pleasure and all this stuff. And I had never used one in my entire life. And I was like mortified. Like there was like this di- like dichotomy in myself is like this crazy open punk rock, sexually open person. And then there's this other person in the same body at the same time being like, this is scandal. Like, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's easier to like advocate for others than it is for yourself. Like it's easier to be like here, other person, let me show you all these options, but that's for you. It's not for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it, so that was, that was a surprising reason. It's like, oh my gosh, like, what was I so afraid of? <laughs> yeah. So, um, So we're like, collectively, we've been through a really hard time. It doesn't really seem like it's letting up a lot of shit going on in the world right now. Sometimes I like I'm, I'm, I'm promoting this event into pleasure and um, it's a, it's a virtual like pleasure positive event. And I have been dealing with a little bit of, I don't know, guilt, I guess, because I feel like, is it insensitive for me to be talking about pleasure right now? Like, is this okay? Like, I don't, I mean, obviously the answer is yes, it's okay. And that's what we need. Right. But why do you think it's so important or exponentially more important to have a pleasure practice in times like these? Oh, I mean, I think it's so important. I mean, it's, it's really hard to deal with all the things in the world. And if we can find moments for ourselves and I, I get the, like, feels very like frivolous, but it's really not like learning to sit in your own pleasure for you know, at least a little bit during the day is going to help. It helps you deal with everything. It makes it a little bit easier. It might, I don't know. It inspires compassion. It inspires, um, this feeling of oneness with other people. I really feel like when we find our own pleasure, we're more, we're easier on other people. And we see the more positive side of the human standing next to us so that we can be a little bit more compassionate for where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think exploring pleasure is exactly where we need to be right now. It's hard. It is hard. (laughs) Hard time. And things are so sad everywhere. And, you know, finding pleasure in like, you know, taking a bath or even just like having a conversation with a stranger on the corner, you know, it's, it's so important. Mm -hmm. Do you find that pleasure inspires empathy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like the more that I do this work and the more that I study and practice, like the more my compassion builds, the more my empathy builds and it's, but it's kind of like what I was saying, um, you know, it's for other people, like, like it is for myself, but I, I have an easier time having compassion and empathy for strangers than I do for like (laughs) most of the people in my family. So like, like that's the thing for my therapist to work through with me, but you know, it's, um, it's tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is sometimes easier to have empathy for a stranger, but maybe someone else has a different experience. 
you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But the building, building of empathy is, is a big component of this. And I do feel like if the world was more empathetic, then we, we would all be operating. The system of our world would be operating differently. Mm-hmm. Yes. The bigger systems of oppression would be operating differently. Yes. And you know, peekaboo, if they would just listen to us, everything would be better. It's true. <laughs> You know, it's so much, so much work, so much effort to get out. How many times do we have to say this? How many people in history need to have this conversation to turn this fucking ship? I know. Just keep going. We just have to keep going. It's all it is. Like we have to, we have to turn our light and light others and we keep spreading the light. And that's what it's all about. It is. And it's all just maybe one person, new person steps into the light every day. And that's all that we can do. Yes, it is all that we can do. But thank you for sharing your light with me today. Thank you for having me. Yes. I know we could talk for like hours and hours. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I'm (laughs) very excited about what you're doing and your new project and um, you know, would love in, in some kind of dream world to be involved in some way, but I love it. I'm very excited for you. I would love to have you in this project. Um, if there's a virtual, if we can get you in somehow, Mm -hmm. I will. We'll see. Maybe I'll have some New York trips coming up. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Peekaboo, where can people learn more about you and, and follow all of your adventures? Um, you can find my website is I love peekaboopoint.com and you can find me on Instagram is where I'm most active, although less active since the pandemic, because I've put it into perspective. <laughs> um, and that's at peekaboo point. Um, and yeah, feel free to send me messages and say hello. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that you like can still exist and do great work and maybe even greater work without posting it every two seconds on Instagram? It's really liberating. (laughs) Oh my God. It's amazing. It's amazing. I took it off of my phone uh, two months ago and I have had the best two months of my life. Like, Oh, it's great. You took it off your phone. I took it off my phone. Scandal. I it is a scandal. <laughs> I've I've unfollowed people. I am just on my computer posting here and there. Um, because it's just not good for me. I just don't, I can't. And so, like, I'm I'll eventually have it back on, but I'm trying to have less people to follow. So I scroll less because mm-hmm. that's the thing. Like, I'm stopping the scroll. <laughs> yeah. And when you stop scrolling, you stop comparing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Ah. And then you can focus on like what you actually want and what you actually feel and not be influenced by influencers. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I, bet. I so, might, I might think about maybe one day doing, that. you know, if you need some help, if you need like a hand to hold, I'm there for you. I, I get it. I, I totally get it. It's tough. It is. I remember, oh, especially as a performer, because you have all this time backstage. So what the hell are you going to do? <laughs> but that's also been fun. I'm like, Ooh, I get to read and this is great. I get to do my work and yeah. Or have conversations with other humans. That are yeah. Back with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, who knew? Yeah. Um, anyway, with all that said, make sure you follow peekaboo. <laughs> 
because <laughs> maybe she'll post someday. Um, I do sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, and you can follow us at I Look Down There and me at Michelle Amore. And I mentioned this earlier, but I have a big virtual pleasure positive event coming up on April 2nd called Into Pleasure. There'll be five pleasure experts presenting on a variety of topics. So it's great if you're new to pleasure or if you consider yourself to be a pleasure pro, um, it's going to be super fun. So check it out at intopleasure.com. And now spread your legs, spread the love, like us, follow, share, subscribe, all of that good stuff. And remember that confidence comes from the bottom up. So grab a mirror and look down there. Until next time. <laughs>